this is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to That UFO Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy, and I am joined today by former Air Force security officer who was part of an incredible UFO event at Vandenberg Air Force Base in 2004. You may have heard him recently on the Merged Podcast with Ryan Graves. I'd like to welcome Jeffrey Nucitelli. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Very good to have you on as well. Really enjoyed seeing and hearing you on Ryan's podcast. Um, you don't get the perks on this podcast of being taken to a lovely studio with a very handsome host sitting across from you, Ryan is. Um, but, you know, let's let's get this done. A lot of listeners were very interested when I said you were coming on, turning this round at quick notice as well. So let's get it done, Jeff. Um, right. Before we get into the incident itself, which is fascinating, the details you've got on that as well, um, a pretty incredible recent event. I want to know a little bit about you. What's what's your background and growing up, and when did you get an interest in the UFO topic? Uh, so I grew up in Western Pennsylvania in a little coal mining town, um, not far from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, my father is a coal miner. My grandfather is a coal miner. So I come from a coal mining family. I'm the first non coal miner in my family. So uh, yeah, I grew up in a in a little town. And um, my interest started young. My grandmother and my grandfather on my mother's side were actually witnesses to a a pretty famous UFO event that happened, um, I think, in 1968 in Lake Erie. They were um, they were there fishing. And it's called the Presque Isle incident. Um, And what happened was my grandmother and grandfather were out on a little boat and uh it was getting near evening and they were coming in to dock and my grandmother saw this this big craft fly by uh there's a famous lighthouse there like a park in a lighthouse and she her and my grandfather saw a craft uh go by the lighthouse and then land on the beach and um they didn't know what to make of it. And the next morning, my grandmother made my grandfather drive out to the site. And uh, allegedly, my grandmother found um, that the beach had been turned to glass in areas. Um, and then there were multiple uh, other witnesses to that event. It ended up in all the papers. Um, and that was pretty much all my grandmother and f- grandfather saw. But other witnesses claimed that there was a uh, some kind of large creature running around. The police were involved. There were multiple witnesses. Um, I think the FBI came out and they took um, uh, molds of this craft had left impressions in the ground. Um, So yeah, that's where it started for me. Uh, As a kid, my grandmother would, would tell me this story and she wasn't the type of person to make things up like that. She was a very, um, she was very, you know, concerned about her reputation and things like that. But that was one story that she would tell everybody. Um, so that piqued my interest. And then my my father actually um, witnessed the Kecksburg fireball when he was a young man. He, had, he was outside and he saw, along with thousands of other people, this fireball come screaming in. Um, and he saw that. Um, so that's kind of where my interest started. You know, as a kid, I I heard these stories from my family and then I was always into sci-fi and, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, and um, read a lot of science fiction. So I was always into it, but I was never really deep into the lore of, you know, the UFO world. Um, That came a little bit later. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm from and how I got interested so quite a base level interest. It was one of those you were friendly to the topic, a little bit geeky, like in your sci-fi growing up, but you weren't going to libraries and, and getting all the books out, all the, the videotapes, whatever it might have been, and, and really diving into it. But you were friendly to the topic and quite a lineage there from your family as well. So that's, that's really interesting. And before the Vandenberg Air Force Base incident, had you ever had any sort of sighting yourself? I did. The the. The first, and I've never spoken about this uh, publicly, but the first incident uh, that I ever witnessed was in um, 
1993 or 1994, I was stationed at Misawa Air Force Base in Japan. And uh, I was a, uh, a guard inside, uh, it was the third space tracking um, facility. They trapped, tracked objects at deep space. It was this large multi-acre facility that we guarded. And, and just and, objects, because I'm, I'm an idiot. So explain that to me. Is that like potential missiles coming in or is that like meteorites, satellites burning up? What would it be? I, I think they were tracking objects in orbit, so right. space trash and, and things like that. Okay, um, but I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure because it was a deep space tracking uh, facility, and uh, so I was posted there along with uh, at the entry control point that night. I was on the internal security patrol with another person, and a couple of us were were standing outside. It was evening. Uh, looking into the the area and the area is this enormous like field and there are these gigantic ray domes with um, satellites and antennas in them. It's a ray dome field. And um, we were just out in the back talking, taking a break. And we saw this orb just appear and, and go whoop. And it was about 50, maybe a hundred feet away it looked like the size of a basketball and it just appeared low to the ground. It arced through the air and vanished. And we all looked at each other and like, what did you, did you see that? We all saw it. And then we got nervous because we thought maybe um, they were pulling an exercise on us or something. So we, I called it in, I called it into the control center and uh, we went on alert and we went out, responded, looked around. But I remember as soon as I called it in over the radio, and I said it might have been a flare. As soon as that came out of my mouth, my brain said that was not a flare. You know, it was like that was there's no way that that was a flare. Um, so that was the first, I guess, anomalous thing I've ever seen. Um, and then there were I've seen other strange things in the sky, but nothing that uh, nothing with all the observables, the five observables. Sure. Um, until uh, the incident in 2003 and then um, some of the other incidents that occurred in, at Vandenberg because there was a multitude of incidents that happened in October, 2003 and then several incidents that happened in later years while I was there. Well, so, let's jump, let's jump forward to that then Jeff. Now Vandenberg air force base, tell us about it. Where exactly is that located? So that uh, the base is located on the central coast of California. So it's North of Santa Barbara and, uh, um, and it's a massive installation. It's like a hundred thousand acres of land, uh, stretches like 30 miles of coastline. And it's basically, um, just the base. There's no housing around there. there it, it's sort of isolated on the coast. Um, and that base at the time was the primary base for the national missile defense project. And that was a, a new initiative to uh, intercept incoming ballistic missiles and things like that. So we were extremely busy at that time. You know, the war had started in 2001. Um, we had a heavy deployment mission and we were, we had a very robust law enforcement mission there too, because we had jurisdiction on some of the highways that run uh, through California, the 101 and the one. Uh, so we worked a lot with, you know, California highway patrol and Santa Barbara, county sheriff's office so we had a it was a very busy base uh, active with launches active law enforcement mission active uh, deployment tasking so. and essentially that was your role i understand you are law enforcement for the base yeah, yeah correct yeah so take us back then you mentioned the first incidents started in october 20 or 20 2003 right. uh, is that something you were a witness to or is that something you were told of so initially I was a, uh, I guess you could call it a secondary witness. I didn't see any of the objects, um, but I was on duty. Um, we had, an, we had the Vandenberg red square event had happened earlier in the, in the morning. And then later on shift, we had another series of encounters and let's go back minute, to the, let's go back then. Yeah. To that first event. Let's, let's take it back. We'll rewind it. Um, the first event Vandenberg red square, uh, and that was talked about by Ryan Graves at the hearings back in July. I think that's when that event first came to prominence for, for many folks. Is that something 
you had talked about for a long time, even in private, or and what were your feelings when you heard that mentioned kind of live at the hearing? Yeah, so so it, you, I used to um, talk a lot about it privately with people um, that didn't know me well. And, uh, and then it kind of turned into a bar story. You know, uh, people would be telling stories like, oh, this wild thing happened. I'm like, I, I can trump that. You know, and I would tell, tell about this UFO event. But over the years, um, there, I had a few uncomfortable moments where I told the story and uh, people got very uncomfortable and, and you know, didn't want to discuss it. Um, and is that just because it's a UFO story? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, a lot of people just, they can't accept it. And um, they immediately think, you know, you're making something up. You know, mm. the, the last time I, d- I discussed it um, publicly was a few years ago. Well, not publicly. It was privately at an event. And um, it was sort of at an Ivy League institution. And I, I was there for a, a, an event. And um, I met a filmmaker. And she was telling me how she was looking for interesting stories. And I, I was like, I've got an interesting story for you. <laughs> and I told her the story and um, she was very attentive and everything. But after we got to talking, she was like, okay, well, thank you. And, you know, have a great night. And she wandered off. So after that, I thought, you know, I, I need to kind of keep my mouth shut about this and, and be careful who I'm talking to. Um, and then I was quiet about it. Um, I just stopped talking about it. And um, until the hearing uh, or prior to the hearing um, after I had reached out to, to Ryan Graves at Americans for safe aerospace. And, um, and then Ryan put me into contact. I met with some lawmakers and their staff um, and then talked to arrow and, and on and on. And then it came up in the hearing. And how do you feel when you hear it mentioned? <laughs> so what I was absolutely not expecting it to come up in the hearing, neither was Ryan. And, um, and he handled it really well. He handled it great. And it, it was a mix of elation and shock and some fear because I was trying to walk this all out in a very um, controlled manner. And my plan had been to gather more witnesses and more hard evidence like documents before I came out publicly with the story. And at the time, I had also only spoken to one other witness that was with me at Vandenberg. I hadn't reached out to the other people that actually saw these craft. So uh, it was it was a mix of like elation, fear, and and then it was like, well, it's out now. And um, and then I decided, all right, you know, now it's time to get to work, track down, you know, my my buddies, and get the story out. So the story itself then, take us back to that morning uh, and let's tell the listeners and viewers what happened. So I, at the time, I was assigned to Bravo Flight. Uh, Flights are like platoons in the Air Force. So I was on Bravo Flight. Um, We have about, you know, 60 or more people working on each flight. I came in to work uh, for the evening shift. I came in a bit early to do changeover with the offgoing leadership from Delta Flight. Delta Flight had been on duty that morning. And when I, I pulled into work, there was a big crowd at the smoke pit across from our armory at the squadron building. And I, I knew something was up, something big had happened. And then when I drove by, everybody started pointing at me like, oh, there's Jeff, there's Jeff. And I, I could tell they had, you know, something good to tell me. So I, I walked over and everybody starts to tell me all at once about they had this real world UFO event that happened that morning. And the short version was that these Boeing contractors had called and reported this enormous floating object over the launch facility. And, um, and then the on duty leadership, the flight chief and their senior patrolman had responded out there, uh, conducted an investigation, interviewed the witnesses, took sworn written statements. And, um, and then uh, that was pretty much it. I went to the command center I, I was debriefed by those people that had responded. I got the full story. And what had happened was the Boeing contractors were working on launch facility 21 on North base. And they called their range control. It's like an operation center for all the different launch facilities. And they reported that there was this enormous uh, hundred yard or larger red 
glowing square hovering at low altitude over the launch facility, making no noise, um, with no observable propulsion system or, or any kind of infrastructure that would allow flight. And they, uh, they watched it for a while, and then they picked up the phone. They called range control. They spoke to a technical sergeant that was on duty, relayed all the information. That individual called around to different um, – uh, they called the, the, the tower and weather to find out if they had weather balloons up or anything on radar. Uh, the results were negative. And then they, that person called the law enforcement desk and notified the police. And that's how we got involved. So that was the initial um, event that happened that morning. And as I was being briefed, I was making copies of all the, the witness statements, the blotter entry, and all the associated paperwork. And I, I had a whole file of it. And then uh, what now might be a good time. I, I can read to you and, and to your audience the actual documents. Yeah, can. please do. So what I've done is I've just typed them out uh, verbatim and I've redacted the names. So when I read it, I'll, I'll say something like Master Sergeant X notified and talk to person Y. So uh, let, let me go ahead and pull it up. I'll, I'll read the blotter entry first. And the blotter entry is an official chronological record, a police record of all the events that happened on that day. So this is a transcript of the Air Force Form 53, which is the Security Forces blotter, um, dated 14 October 2003. It's entry number 13 taken at... 0845 hours local and the title of the blotter entry is patrol response unidentified flying object so it lists first the complainant technical sergeant x it lists his organization and duty phone and then it would it uh, lists three witnesses witness one two and three each one is a boeing contractor and it lists their duty phone their work phone number and then there's a written summary. Tech Sergeant X notified the Security Forces Command Center. He received a call telling him there was a red square object hovering in the air above LF-21. Master Sergeant X, Police 1, and Technical Sergeant X, Police 1 Alpha, were dispatched and responded. Upon arriving on scene, there was no evidence of any hovering objects in the vicinity Senior Master Sergeant X from Range Control and Staff Sergeant X from Base Operations were notified and relayed there were no sightings on their radar during that time period. Master Sergeant X approached the witnesses at LF-21 and LF-10 who reported seeing the unidentified flying object. For further information, refer to Air Force Form 1168s, and those are statements. And then it lists everyone who was notified. It, uh, Lieutenant Colonel X, who is my commander, the Security Forces commander, Senior Master Sergeant X, the Security Forces Operations Superintendent, Staff Sergeant X, Security Forces Office of Investigation, that's the police investigators, Special Agent X with Air Force OSI, and Airman First Class X from the command post. So though that is the, the blotter entry. And now I can read to you the, um, the witness statement. This is from the technical sergeant that received the initial call from the Boeing contractors. And he was brought in uh, later in the day and, and wrote a sworn written statement. So I'll read that now. Uh, this is Air Force Form 1168 statement of witness dated 14 October 2003, taken at 1531 hours local. The narrative. I, Technical Sergeant X, was working on shift at Missile Maintenance Operations Center, pardon me, on 14 October 2003, approximately at 900 hours, received a call from Refurb Maintenance Team, Mr. X, stating there was a large floating object over the hill by LF-21. I asked how big it was, and he replied it was huge. I then asked, is it bigger than 20 feet? And he replied, yes. 
he indicated that it was a large square shape and red in color. He also indicated that it was not making any noise, just floating in the air. At that time, I called weather to see if they had sent up any weather balloons or test equipment. Negative response. Then I called security forces to inquire if they were notified about any such such objects. Negative response. I also contacted command post and a 76 helicopter squadron. Negative response. At this time, I attempted to call Mr. X back at LF-10 to get an update. No answer on site due to maintenance in progress. Security forces said that they would send a unit out to investigate. The unit reported no signs of any floating objects. At approximately 11.15 hours, I was able to contact Mr. X on site, and he indicated that the object floated over the hilltops and then disappeared to the east. Security forces called me for my personal info and requested that I would come by to make a statement. End of state. So those are the two documents that I still have in my possession. So thank you for reading those out. They're really interesting. And I think if it was me, I would be looking for details of the object, like as in it's red and a square. I believe on Merged Podcast, you described it as a squashed almost shape. Yeah, so not perfectly flat, but it would have been had some depth to it essentially yeah yeah as far as i can remember from from reading those witness statements um and and that's kind of the issue i'm i'm trying to recall what i read on the the secondhand accounts from 20 years ago but to the best of my recollection the way that um witness number one he's the one that that called in the complaint I, i remember his statement being the most detailed and um yeah, to the best of my recollection, it was just described as a like a flattened square of enormous size, uh, you know, larger than a football field. And, and was there any mention of detail within that? I'm thinking in my head, you know, like the Borg ship in Star Trek, where it's got it's got detail to it. But then I think of my own little boy, two year old, has like a red brick that he puts into like a shape sorter, mm-hmm. and that's smooth. It, was there any mention of anything like that? Not that I remember, no. That's the that's the difficulty when you don't have folks with a massive UFO interest digging into these things, isn't it? But right. I suppose when you mention, you know, there's a huge football field sized object hovering above the base, that's enough for folks to be like, wow. Um I wonder, had there ever been incidents before that yourself or others on the base at the time could relate to whether that was some sort of object, but it turned out to be adversarial technology or a mistaken weather balloon, for example, when you mentioned that weather had been contacted? No, we the, the only types of serious in, incidents we would have had like that would have been, it's called an unannounced aircraft arrival. And um, that's when, you know, a pilot might get lost or they might have an emergency and they're, they're trying to find a place to land. But other than that, we we never had any serious um, threats to the installation from an adversarial, like a, a foreign nation or power. Uh, most of the threats we dealt with were local um, people that, that were against the weaponization of space or they had political motivations or, or things like that. Uh, but nothing, nothing like this had happened. Uh, I, I got to Vandenberg in uh, the end of... Um, 1999. So I'd been there for a few years by this point. Um, so no, not until that happened. But then <laughs> after it happened, then there was a series of events that happened. And th- those continued not weeks and months later, but that day, didn't they? And that's where you come into it even further. So do you want to carry on with the, the story? So yeah, so um, so yeah, I get the, the, the initial briefing and then we go on duty. And, you know, there was all this excitement and energy and all my friends were excited and a lot of them are in, you know, interested in this subject. And then there were other people that just sort of blew it off and shrugged their shoulders or, or didn't want to engage in it or they just said, oh, you know, whatever. Um, but there was a, you know, pre- people were pretty excite- excited and I desperately wanted to see one, you know. So uh, I went to the armory. I got thermal imagers. I got night vision. I got some binocs. 
And then I spent most of the shift um, out looking around, looking at the sky, driving around the base. And then sometime in the evening, I, I had been out by the ocean and I was out of my car and I had the NVGs out looking at the sky. And then I, I started to like, I had like a moment of clarity and I'm like, you know, what if it shows up, you know, you're out here by yourself and you, you know, and I got nervous. So I drove back to our command center and I was there for a while talking, you know, to, to my other buddies on the command center, the dispatcher. And, um, and then a radio transmission came in, something to the effect of, you know, uh, control be advised. And it was the uh, security patrol out at Slick 4, Space Launch Facility 4, which is on South Base. So at the opposite end of the base from the morning encounter. And the radio transmission comes in there like, be advised. There's a strange light out over the ocean. We've been, you know, watching it for some period of time. And it's, it's behaving strangely. So the dispatcher told them, you know, Roger that, keep an eye on it, keep us advised. And then, uh, you know, I started to get excited. I'm like, oh, you know, maybe I should head out there. And then very quickly, uh, the transmissions came back in and they, and they became more frantic and nervous. And they were saying this object is now moving very erratically. It appears to be getting closer and larger. Um, and then quickly it, all hell broke loose. And then people were screaming on the radio. They're saying, you know, this thing is coming right towards us. Now it's coming right at us. And now it's right here. And that's when it got really difficult to hear the radio transmission because other people were chiming in and uh, other people were trying to break into the net to, to give additional information. And the dispatchers were trying to, you know, provide command and control. And, um, so by this time I'm in my car headed out there listening and then they uh, reported that it, that it had shot off. So when I got out to the entry control point to slick four, everybody was waiting, everybody was outside and I, and they told me what happened. And apparently uh, this thing came in, it was moving very strangely and erratically, not like an aircraft. And then it accelerated it, it came in very rapidly and it slowed down and then its light went out and it went dark and then it stopped and just hovered um, not far from the entry control point. And this was another somewhat square shaped, enormous object. So it might have been the same thing or it might have been something different. Uh, because now it was dark and the, the object after its light went out was dark, but they could see that it was just enormous, um, sort of square shaped and making no noise, silently hovering. And they watched it for like a, around 45 seconds to a minute. Uh, there was about six people there. And then it, it just drifted off, uh, same as before. And everybody was rattled. They were shaken up. Some people were frightened. Some people were excited. Like, oh, my God, you know, I just saw a real UFO. So I talked to everybody. I believe I took statements. I don't remember 100%, but I can't imagine that I didn't. And um, and then I believe we put it in the blotter entry. We, we up-channeled the incident because it was a security incident. Um, so there should be a record of that uh, somewhere in the archives. So that was the second event. And you mentioned, thanks for painting a lovely picture of that. Six people saw that one. Um Late 2003, I've literally just Googled. Now, I would have been 17, 16, 17. Um, what camera phones were around? Camera phones were becoming popular, but you're still looking at minimal megapixels. And I mean, like, low single digits, probably. I take it at that point, there was no one had something on them that could have filmed it? Or was there any local CCTV that could have picked up at all? Now, uh, no one got photos uh, from phones. And, um, and that's the thing I think people need to understand. Phones were not the same 20 years ago. The yeah. cell phones, they were, they were not at all. And uh, you could take pictures with them. But even back then, I don't, I don't know if social media was really a thing back then. There, there was nowhere to put those pictures. I, maybe there was. Yeah. But, um, so no photos. And the other point I'd like to make is, is when these events happen, they just happen. Hmm. So if, if 
you're not on top of the ball or you're not just happen to have your phone out, um, chances are you, you might not get any information. Now, as far as the site, the site does have cameras all around it, but those cameras are typically watching the perimeter of, mm. of the security area. And many of them are only uh, active when an alarm is tripped. And some are active 24 hours and recording data 24 hours. Others are not. But they're not typically uh, pointed up. They're pointed out. But because that facility is actually up, it's on an elevated position on a bluff overlooking the ocean. So it's possible that some of the cameras, if they were looking out, could have picked up this object, especially because it approached the entry control point. And we had cameras all like in, in, in a 360 there. So it could have been recorded. Um, yeah. Given the magnitude of the sighting in the morning and then the objects return later that day, numerous people see them. You've got the, the Boeing private contractors. You've then got the, the base personnel the six individuals, I'm assuming, are all base personnel, yeah? Um, yeah all, they were all cops. Yeah, they all see the objects. Is there any external activity happens then on the base? Does anyone come from outside the base to visit? I'm not even saying men in black, you know, quote-unquote, but do any other military personnel visit on the day at that time to say, look, something's been going on, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge, no. No, it, it was, these events happened, and then, we were like, what now? And it's like, go to work, you know? And like I said, uh, everyone in the chain of command on the base that needed to know was notified, but there was, we didn't have a checklist for UFOs. There was no procedure there. You know, there was no, nothing to, we had uh, written no protocols to react to it. So we just treated it as like an odd security incident. And then we went back to work. It's interesting timing. I listened to the Weaponized podcast that came out today with Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp. And George Knapp was playing tapes he recorded in the late 90s uh, with Philip J. Corso. And Philip J. Corso is talking about um, how, given the U US government and the military's stance was there are no such thing as UFOs, then if something crashed and was recovered, there was nothing to recover in the first place, so nothing crashed. If there were bodies recovered, they didn't make sense because since they don't exist you can't recover bodies from something that doesn't exist and that's similar to like you say there that you know there was no checklist for ufos so there's no there's no protocol for it there's nothing to follow it's just something that happens and then it goes and i think for folks like myself that's been a little bit easier to understand over the years that you think well something must have happened and everyone must have been involved and like you say it really was just an event it happened the next shift starts that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So. What's the stigma like at that point then? So you're talking the first, I wonder that first event happens, the the contractor see the large square. Uh, I'm guessing daylight at that point. It was eight, nine o'clock in the morning. Right. Um, there was a lot of folks you said were interested. Some folks not so interested. It then happens again with base personnel. I wonder at that point, is there a lot of chatter that carries on and how long does that go on for? Or does just life return to normal really quickly? The, the, the interest in the chatter went on for some time. Uh, and, it, you know, it died down over the, over the period of, of a month or two. But, um, but that, that one month period, um, I can give you a little bit of information about a second encounter that happened uh, and I'm friends with the witness and he's ready to come forward with, with this event. We're trying to find the other person he, he's, he, um, experienced this event with, but in that same time frame, we know that this event happened before October 30th, because this individual deployed to Iraq on October 3rd. So we know he was, this happened between the 14th and the 30th, but he was posted on another security patrol, not far from the flight line at Vandenberg. Uh, Vandenberg has the third largest flight line in the world, I think. It was actually developed as a secondary landing, emergency landing flight line for the space shuttle. So we had this enormous flight line with no planes. We had a small helicopter squadron, but just this massive empty flight line. And this individual and another cop were on patrol and um, at night, 
and same thing. They spot a strange light over the ocean, over the Western Ocean. They call it in. The light starts to move erratically. It starts to uh, drop in altitude. And they knew this was unusual as it approached the base because at the time, the, um, the traffic control tower was closed. There was you know, no one on duty. So there should have been no aircraft approaching. So as this light got closer, it, it dropped very low in elevation and looked like it was going to come in and land on the runway. So my buddies called it in. Uh, it was put out over the radio as an unannounced aircraft arrival, which is one of the most serious events that can happen on an Air Force base. Uh, you don't want a random aircraft landing on your installation. So we went on full alert. Uh, people responded to the flight line. And um, the witness lost sight of the object as it came down. It was behind some trees. So this thing, you know, you figure the trees, maybe 50 feet tall. Uh, so this thing was lower than 50 feet. And that's when they lost visual. But they couldn't see anything other than this strange light. Now, after that event happened, the next morning, the people that called in that encounter were called in to and, and debriefed. And when they were debriefed, they were made to feel extremely uncomfortable. They were they felt like they had done something wrong, had seen something they shouldn't, and they were very nervous, and they were forced to sign documents. So after that happened, the individual that was debriefed came to my house because I was actually his direct supervisor and said, Hey man, they just called me into this room and they kept me there and scared the shit out of me and made me sign all this paperwork. And, um, and then we talked and he's like, what do I do? And I'm like, I don't know. We just need to be careful because I, you know, that hadn't happened to anybody up to that point. So it was very strange. It's like, Six guys saw a UFO the other day. No one was debriefed or called in. Nobody called me in, and I had responded. It was mm. in the blotter entry, so it was publicly available information. Same thing with the Boeing contractors. Now, I don't know if they were debriefed or, or what, but then we have this other encounter where it looks like a craft might have landed, and suddenly the tone changes. And now, you know, the, the witnesses are, are made to feel uncomfortable mm. and you know so th there's a there's a lot that happened there and um and like i said that witness is ready to come forward and uh and and a few others so and do you think given the differences in the events it was just the fact the object appeared to have landed that caused that additional debriefing and intimidation almost if that's a fair word to use i think i think it it, it, because it was uh, logged as an unannounced aircraft arrival, and that's so serious, where the other one was just an incident, right? There yeah. was no, um, you know, it's hard to categorize something just flying over a site. But when something is, is logged as an unannounced aircraft arrival, that goes all the way up to higher headquarters. They want to know, you know, who landed. Was it a pilot in trouble in a Cessna, or was it a defector? It, you know, what... Was it a terrorist incident or whatever? And that might be the, the cause for the additional scrutiny and debriefing. And I might have missed this, Jeff, so forgive me, but I'm wondering on all of these incidents, how many systems or sensors would have picked up the objects officially? I wonder, was it just people saw them with their own eyes or were systems picking these things up? Because I wonder, is that data there that organizations such as Arrow can and should be looking at? Yeah, as far as the other sensors, I'm not sure what they captured. I only know from the blotter entry and things like that that they reported that they had no radar contact and no weather balloons up, things like that. But Vandenberg, um, because of its mission, we had multiple other agencies that mm -hmm. were operating on the base. And that's basically what they did. It was um, intelligence gathering systems and signals. Um, and they had very advanced capabilities at Vandenberg. Whether any of these objects were picked up on any of those sensors, I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't have access to that information. 
It's one thing when I spoke to folks back uh, about the Tic Tac event a few years ago, they mentioned various facilities along the coast potentially would have picked up the Tic Tacs on various systems. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why folks may or may not have quickly got on board those ships after Commander Fravor and co had engaged the Tic Tac. And, you know, it wasn't just a case that the Princeton and Nimitz were keeping an eye on these things, that other agencies on land were also aware they were there because of various systems picking them up. And it would make sense if you've got various, very sophisticated um, missile tracking sensors and whatnot, and I'm probably bastardizing the language here, but it's as good as I can do, then some of these may or may not pick up other objects that are coming in from various different distances, atmospheres, from under the water. Um, was there any chat around if they were coming in from up, or were they coming from below, or if they were coming kind of straight across? None of the witnesses that I know personally could discern. It just appeared as a light over the ocean initially. So they just saw this strange light above the horizon. And um, so they don't know where it came from. Did it come up out of the water? Did it come from from space? Did it, They have no idea. It just suddenly there's a light and then you watch it and then it starts to behave strangely. And then all of a sudden you're in, you're in, a, you know, like a movie. <laughs> Yeah, you're in the Twilight Zone. Sure. Um, you mentioned that's now three events all happening in a very short space of time. Were there further events you are privy to or have knowledge of since those? Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. froze up for oh, a second. No, that's okay. Um, so that's a few different events you've mentioned. They happen in a very short space of time. Since those, were there events that happened after the October or anything you were privy to? Yeah, we... Um I had a personal event that happened, um, I think it was around 2005, uh, on Vandenberg. I was off duty, and I, but I was with two other friends of mine that were also uh, police. And we had a very um, spectacular and very up-close encounter on the base. And um, I'm waiting to tell the full story because the other two witnesses are going to come out with me because you know, it's not my story. They were standing right there with me. So we're looking forward to bringing that incident out. But I will say when it happened, after it happened, at the time, I was the non-commissioned officer in charge of law enforcement. So I was running the, the law enforcement program for the base. And um, so after it happened, I picked up the phone. I called our control center. I briefed them on what happened. I asked them to contact, you know, the tower to find out radar tracks, to call weather, and uh, to put it in a blotter entry. So that's another document. If it still exists, I would like to get my hands on. Um, so, yeah, that happened also. So since then, you have spoken to Arrow. Uh Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick has just departed Arrow um, onto Pastures New. Um, that's a whole different story for another time. Yeah. I, I wonder, what was your experience with Arrow? Um, they approached you, I take it, or did you approach them with the details? Um, Ryan Graves coordinated me meeting with Arrow. So, um, and then Arrow reached out to me, and then we, uh, we set up a date, and, and we had a very lengthy and interesting conversation. Uh, but my experience with Arrow was overwhelmingly positive. So, uh, like I said, we spent a lot of time on the phone and I got the sense after, after we spoke for a while that, um, this person was for, you know, he explained who he was, what his career was, what he had done hmm. and a small world. It ends up that he was around or he was at Vandenberg in this time frame, 2000. 3, 2004, for a different um, um, unrelated event. And it also ends up that this investigator and I actually know some of the same people and know some some of the same bad actors. So we built some reports like, oh, we know some of the same people and have worked like on the periphery of each other's, um, like in a law enforcement capacity. So, uh, yeah, basically they were – the the arrow people were, they seemed to me genuinely interested in the case. They seemed genuinely interested in resolving the case and, and investigating it. 
and they explained to me where they were going to go and look for data. Um, they also explained that they have access to go and look at special access programs and they wanted to check to make sure it's not something we were doing or some, you know, uh, special access program. So they are, they look wherever they can look. And I felt that, um, you know, they, they honestly want to get to the bottom of these cases too. And they offered, you know, to collaborate with me if I get additional information to share it. And I've, I've done that. I've given them uh, multiple updates and they've been in contact with me sharing what they have and haven't found. So in general, it, it was really a positive experience. Uh, you know, we got along very well. We know some of the same people worked in, in, you know, in the same career field. And, um, you know, I, I felt very good about going to Arrow. Uh, you'll have heard it was quite a mixed experience for others. Some folks feel that the information was taken, but nothing will happen off the back of it. But you're, you're under the impression that it was followed up on, it's still being followed up on, and it's it's got a purpose, yeah, in, in your eyes. Yeah, and the, the thing is too, uh, and I brought this up on, on the Merge podcast, I, I have been told that a lot of the law enforcement data that the Air Force and OSI and the DOD in general should have archived hmm. is gone, meaning destroyed, lost, deleted. Um, so if that's true, then there's not a lot that anyone can do to look at historical cases because the data's gone. It just becomes your word testimony. It's just your words. You know, it's just a story without data. And that's why... I knew the paperwork I had was so important. Oh, I didn't know the data might be missing, but I knew this is an official document. Anyone can go into a, a FOIA request. The government can go in and, and pull all this information. Um, so it was disappointing to find out that all that historical data might just be gone. So that if that's true, that means they, there's nothing for them to go back and research. The blotters are gone. The statements are gone. Um, so I'm hoping that's not true. And the other thing, well, yeah, I'll just leave it. I'll just leave it at that. Well, the last few days I've interviewed a few different folks, including Jeffrey Kripo and Dr. Colm Kelleher, and I've tried to make a point of mentioning the date when I record because the interviews are going out at different times. Um, this is Tuesday the 5th of December as we record this. The Schumer Rounds Amendment, uh, the UAP Disclosure Act is all the talk right now on social media um, within the House and Senate in the United States. A lot of arguing back and forward going on. How closely have you been following that, Jeff, as to what's going on right now? I've been following it as closely as I can, uh, but things are un unfolding pretty rapidly. So I've talked to uh, a few people, a few people reached out to me um, that are in the community, let's say, uh, with some inside information. And there's kind of two camps. One camp is very worried that, that the legislation is going to just get gutted. And the other camp is less concerned because they, they think it's a, a tool for negotiation. My, I, I had some major concerns with the legislation from the beginning, primarily the eminent domain clause. Mm -hmm. I do not like that at all. Um, Why? Well, imagine if when electricity had been invented that the U.S. government said we have eminent domain over anything to do with electrical generation of power. It, we own it. Um, I, I don't like that. And eminent domain is to, supposed to be used as a last resort for the public good, meaning, you know, we have to put a highway in. Um, so the government is going to force you to sell your property and then they're going to take it. And there's a lot of cases in the U S where eminent domain was used, um, you know, to scam people. So I don't like the, I don't think the U S government has the right to claim proprietary ownership over whatever this is. Because if you think about it, like uh, Dr. Gary Nolan allegedly has fragments that might be from a craft. 
And there might be a lot of other people out there with pieces of technology or information. So imagine if the government just came in to Gary's lab and said, that's ours. And any research you might have done on it is ours. Or any um, new innovative technology that might arise from that is ours. And we'll classify it, keep it secret, and do whatever we want with it. So I was very worried about the eminent domain clause. Um, Let me ask on that, Jeff, if you don't mind, because it's an interesting point of view. A lot of folks will be frustrated if that gets removed because the two big aspects of it for those who haven't kept up to date one eminent domain which is we're going to confiscate crafts bodies just for that's the the blunt language of it essentially but it goes into a lot more nuanced detail the second big aspect is the presidential review board a nine-person panel made up of scientists academics economists etc to work on declassifying documentation basically to get the records out there the, the big one, I think, is that um, eminent domain for me. But it's interesting to hear you say the opposite of what a lot of UFO-friendly folks would probably want. And I understand the argument. Is there any argument to say that it's the lesser of two evils to have the US government potentially go back in and claim crafts and objects that maybe they recovered in the first place or an arm of them covered in, recovered in the first place, which has then been given to a smaller private aerospace company who's probably made trillions of dollars over the years mm-hmm. off of it. Um, and I think the language you used there, Jeff, was a kind of, it should be a last case or worst case scenario that eminent domain is used. Some folks would see that this is uh, that point. It's been 80 years. It's time to go in and do something different now. Just what are your thoughts on that? Well, I agree. I mean, that if if we are at that point where the government, the only way they could get their hands on these uh, technologies that allegedly are in the hands of uh, private corporations is eminent domain. Then they can, I, I understand the point. I think that they could, they could make the law more specific. And instead of claiming general eminent domain over anything related to this topic, that they could, they could rewrite the legislation specifically to address like if the government has given these corporations access or proprietary rights to these objects or craft or technologies, then the government should be able to take them back, take custody of it. Um, So uh, yeah, I understand your point and hopefully there's a good, um, the impetus behind putting that into law is, is good. But right now, you know, it's tough because the government, on one hand, they're, they're, they acknowledge that the phenomenon is real, but they're hiding everything about it. So that, that's my primary concern is, is if the government gets eminent domain powers over everything, then it'll just be hidden forever. You know? Yeah. And I understand that point as well around the language. I think... It's been so hidden, though, in loopholes for a long time, a lot of even the conversation that even when uh, Ronald Bray, no, Scott Bray and Ronald Moultrie sat in that initial hearing last year now, I believe it was, and they sat doing the looking at each other thing of, do you you know anything about that? No, no, do you? No. And it'd be really easy. These guys aren't stupid. I don't care what anyone says. These are intelligent people to get to the levels of, of office and where they are, okay? Um, you can hide behind language. Do you have any, and even Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, we have no evidence of, you know, extraterrestrial technology. Mm. Okay, what is extraterrestrial technology? Is it interdimensional? Well, we don't know that. Yeah, but is it non-human? Maybe it is in a way human, and it starts to get that, you're just twisting words now. You know, essentially, is it alien, quote-unquote, as the general public would know it? So I get why they're trying to umbrella everything to bring it in. People like myself, I just want to see the craft. I want to see the bodies. That's maybe still a ways away, but I understand also your point of view, and I think people have to appreciate, not everyone's going to agree on this, that there's also an element of danger that comes with that over that amount of power, isn't it? It's the the Mark Zuckerberg sitting there being asked, do you think you're too powerful? Uh, Owning everyone's data, essentially, you know? So I I get that point of view. Um, What do you see happening with this 
amendment, the Schumer Rounds amendment, do you think it's going to go in as is? The likelihood seems to be in consensus is it's going to be gutted. And it's. I think I said online, it's a bit like taking the turkey and trimmings away from the Christmas dinner and leaving leaving the salad on the table, basically. Yeah. I, I hope not. Um, I'm, I'm remaining optimistic, mainly because I've talked to some people that um, are very involved behind the scenes and they know the, the players and they are not as worried as I am. <clears throat> so I'm just hoping that they're right, that um, it will get passed. There's definitely going to be changes, but hopefully they don't. What I'm concerned about is the eminent domain clause being removed and the um, the presidential committee being maintained, the records review committee, um, them declassifying all the information. Um, th- for me, that's the main, the, the main um, hope with the legislation that they'll keep that in um, because we need – we need fresh eyes on on the subject. So I'm going to remain optimistic <laughs> until until it, it happens. So, and just before listening to questions, I want to ask you. You've mentioned you've come forward. You're you're what everyone is now considering a newer witness, newer face, newer voice. You've mentioned others are going to be coming forward too that you know you know well. Do you see 2024, regardless what happens with this amendment, being a year where more folks are going to come forward and share their stories in a public way? Yeah, I, I feel that 2024 is going to be a, a like a watershed moment. Um, and that's really what I'm hoping. The more people that we can bring forward, credible witnesses, hopefully with some kind of evidence, um, telling their story in a sincere and honest way, um, I, I'm hoping for a flood of that to happen. Uh, because like I said, with the Vandenberg event, th- there's at least 80 people or more that know it happened. Now they didn't see it happen, but at least they know they can verify that. Yeah, I was there. And I remember hearing about, about the events mm. and, and I am certain that these events are not isolated. I think they have happened, um, all over the world multiple times and the people that have experienced it are like me, you know, you, it happens to you, you know, it's real, but you don't know what to do with it. And then there is the stigma. So if you're out talking about it, you're, you know, all of a sudden you're a lunatic. Um, So I'm hoping the more witnesses come out, the more that the government is talking about it. They have, they're being forced to address it now in the news. And that's a good thing. It might be a good thing that they're, that they're fighting over the legislation because people will start paying attention. You know, why is Chuck Schumer on TV talking about this? Well, because it's important and uh, hopefully that'll get more attention. And my hope is, you know, by me coming out and, and my other friends that are getting ready to come out that we will embolden and encourage other people like us to come out and tell their stories with or without evidence uh, because we need to change the, the paradigm. You know, I was trying to explain to my wife last night what was happening with the, the amendment and the political infighting. And this might be a terrible example, but it's what I used. What I said to her was, imagine someone accused me of having an affair and the evidence was on my phone, which is in my hand. And you would want to know. And I say, no, I'm not having an affair. And I can prove it by just showing you my phone, but I'm refusing to do that. And all you're asking is to see my phone. And I keep saying, nope, but I assure you, I'm not having an affair. The way I can ask, that's the way I described it to her that, you know, they're saying, well, show us the stuff you've got, which might be non-human. And they're saying, we don't have any, but we're not showing you. And that's the way I kind of explained it to her. So um, Mm -hmm. I think more witnesses coming forward. More Jeff Nicitelli's, more David Grush's, more Ryan Graves, more Alex Dietrich's um, would definitely be very, very welcome. Um, I think the subject's not going away, even if this amendment doesn't pass by any way, shape or form. I know Lou Elizondo and others have have tweeted to say um, there is plan A, plan B, plan C Mm -hmm. uh, and more down the line. So if anything, I think it's going to at least be an interesting time, Jeff. Um, A lot of listener questions were sent in for you. Let me get through some of those before we finish up. Okay, great. Um, 
Peter Earnshaw sent in a couple of questions, as he likes to. Um, he says, in the Merged podcast, Jeff states that everything was recorded in security logs, including nearly hitting a deer, for example. Were there any other reports of incidents of high, strange, high strangeness around that time period, whatever they might have been? During that time period, just the UFO high strangeness. And anything like October, November, are you, you know, if you're looking at, I mean, ghosts even on the base being reported, strange lights, anything at all. But also, it might be a nice chance to ask you about your, you kept your own X-Files, essentially, you mentioned as well, didn't you? If you want to mention that too. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't remember anything specifically uh, strange happening other than, you know, all the, the UFO encounters during the time period. But Vandenberg has a, it's a strange place. Um, there had been some very strange things that had happened there, uh, um, not related to UFOs. Um, but no, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. You know, Is there anything the base is particularly known for or any activities that happen that you think might attract a UFO? I think the obvious thing that you can never talk about is nuclear weapons or any nuclear material on the base, but was there anything like that or an event that may have attracted the attention of these objects? Well, it could be uh, because the, the the missile defense project was new, the technology was being worked on, tested, you know. And also, I mean, that land was a um, traditional uh, Native American uh, land. It was a Chumash Indian tribe, tribal land. And there's a point on Vandenberg called um, Tranquillian Peak. I think it might be the highest um, point of elevation on the in California, on the coast. And if you and on top of that mountain is a deep space tracking site. And near the deep space tracking site is an ancient cave uh, that served a ritual function and uh, an astrological function. Uh, there's ancient rock art in there. So it was definitely a sacred site to the Chumash Indians. Um, so who knows? It makes me think of, um, I'm wearing my Monsters in California who they just now, Tom DeLong's recent, have you seen the movie yet? Not Tom yet. DeLong's, no. no give it a watch obviously it's based in california it's american pie crossed with scooby-doo crossed with the x-files um and, and i say that in a nice way don't go in expecting a 200 million dollar epic it's right. not but given what tom's talked about over the years there's some interesting caves as part of that and yeah i won't spoil any more for you but it's, it's worth a watch if you've got any interest in the subject um so yeah and i want tom to come on the podcast eventually so i'm going to be nice about it um but yeah uh does Je this is from aaron aaron asks does jeff think that the non-human intelligence abductions occur on military bases i am certain they were visiting me during my own military career so thanks for that aaron what do you think about abductions do you think they happen or have you heard of them happening on bases um the short answer is yes, I believe they do happen. And um, a matter of fact, I when I was speaking with Arrow, they they went into great length about an abduction case that this individual had in, investigated and was currently investigated. It was, um, oh, it's, I'm blanking on it right now, the Devil's Den incident? Yeah. Yeah, it involved... I think it was Air Force security policemen and they were camping and allegedly abducted. And what the investigator said, you know, the more he looks into it, the more things don't make sense, but the more clues that they are, that there are. So as soon as you might be ready to throw it out the window as a made up fabricated story, they find something that collaborates the story or, 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 piques their interest so they keep digging into it so i wish the abductions you know i hope that they're not true but there are plenty of credible people that have come forward with amazing stories and you know uh, but i don't know anybody personally or i don't know any events about abductions but um i hope they're not real 
Well, the incident at Devil's Den was uh, Terry Lovelace, and I had him on the podcast uh, earlier this year, if you want to refresh yourself on that one, Jeff. Um, he's coming back on very shortly as well. He's uh, he's not too well at the minute, but he's going to be coming back on. Um, fascinating phenomena, pretty terrifying. Um, and I think that's one of those things that if the US government came out tomorrow and said, okay, cards on the table, we're being visited by something. That's one of the first questions the general public, I think, would want to know. And that's probably not an easy answer. Because mm-hmm. um, if it's not a no, then, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of scared folks out there, I think, with that one. Um, question from Paul. Paul asks, and it's similar to what I asked before, but he expands on it. With all the current debate and arguing within the UFO Twitter world, people are only prepared to go so far on what they know. What do you think 2024 holds for not just the UFO community, but the world in general? What I'm hoping to see is more of the same. I'd like to see more congressional hearings, whether they be formal or informal. Um, And I believe uh, Representative Luna and Burchett are looking to do that right now. I think that will, that's a good idea. Get as many, credible witnesses, military and civilian, as you can on stage in front of the public, uh, on a, hopefully on a national stage and generate interest and pressure. So we need to generate pressure on the government because right now the government doesn't have that much pressure on them because the general population and the media aren't engaged in the topic. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that there'll be a lot more, um, information coming out from witnesses. Um, I'm hoping for additional hearings and, you know, there's a lot of chatter behind the scenes about some big, big news coming out in uh, 2024. Um, And I I believe that that's going to happen. Uh, I think some, some really, high level credible people are going to come out and go public and that will help change, change the narrative in in favor. But I think 2024 is going to be a wild year. I mean, I never thought we would get to this point. Um, And now I think we have the momentum. I think we have the high ground and we need to be prepared because if we're over the target, you know, the government's going to try to shut it down. So um, I'm looking for more disclosure in 2024 in a big way. Let me just follow up on that then. You've had David Grush come forward in a pretty big way. And I think it's fair to say many folks like yourself have told your story. The way David Grush came out and his story captured the imagination and it went global. And I, I would measure the impact because... I was getting phone calls about it to go on radio shows in the UK and TV in the UK based on what he said. That's never happened before or after. So the UK press picked up on his comments and and ran with that story for all too short a time, but they ran with it. What sort of level of person or what sort of profile would have to come forward, do you think, and go public for it to catch again and, and catch fire? I, that's a, that's a good question because, you know, for, for me, that's already happened. Uh, yeah. Dave Grush is that guy. It doesn't get, for me, it doesn't get any, any better than that. He is who he says he is. And he, I, you know, I believe, you know, I believe him and I understand the process. I know what it means to go to the inspector general, uh, you know, with, with evidence, um, so for me, it's already happened. So I don't know. I don't know how much higher you need to get. Um, I think when- if I if I walk up and down the street just now, Jeff, and I knock on all my neighbors' doors and I ask them, "Do you know who David Grush is?" They'll say no. And if I tell them what he said, they won't care. Yeah. You might get the odd one goes, "Ah, oh, that's interesting. That that's as far as that'll go." And I just wonder if we get a scientist or an engineer from Lockheed Martin comes forward and says, yeah, I worked on some stuff. I think the UFO Twitter world will go mad and I think they'll be on Joe Rogan. Do I think that'll catch fire for the general public? I still don't think so. That might be the way. It might have to be an insider, uh, you know, and that's probably 
<clears throat> the best answer is one of the program managers of these programs or someone that actually worked on the tech, but they're going to need evidence. Mm. It, it can't just come out because that's already happened. We've had people come out with that are credible. They are who they say they are. Yep. And, um, and people just say, well, show me the thing. So, it, you know, it, maybe it would take a high level intelligence official, somebody running the CIA or whatever organization to come out and say they're real. But then I think you'd have backlash. They say, that's just a psyop. They're hiding whatever they're really doing with the little green men. So maybe it'll take the president. <clears throat> I mean, that would be, that would change everything, you know. I think that's where we're at in the UK, that you would need Prime Minister, whoever that might be, God, we can use them like socks here, um, to come out and, and make a statement yeah. officially on the subject. And I can see why for, for the general populace, and I don't mean the people listening to this or the folks tweeting or Instagramming or Facebooking about the subject, but the 99.9% .9 who just go day to day as they do without an interest in the subject, I think they need that they need that official confirmation. But yeah, I understand why. Yeah. Um this is a question Mark I sh uh, I should have asked Jeff earlier from Mark and he asks, has this experience affected your personal or professional life in any way? And also can you pass on any messages for other witnesses who have experienced events like yours but haven't yet decided to come forward? So yes. I mean when when I I'd always had um, an intuition that the world was much more magical and mysterious and enchanted than, than mainstream science uh, would like to tell us. So I, I kind of started from there, you know, open-minded, like all these things might be real. But then when it happened to me and my friends, then it changed, it changed everything, it changed my entire perspective on life and, and everything. Um, how that plays out practically day to day is hard to, you know, hard to even comment on, but it, it changes your frame of reference for reality. You, you know, now that we are not alone, right? Whatever these things are, because it never entered my mind that this might be human tech or because when you see it, you know, so it changed everything. I, I, you know, and I never stopped looking up at the sky, um, wondering, you know, what's going on? Why are they here? What are they doing? You know, so it, it's unsettling on one, one hand, and then it's very reaffirming on the other, because at least you have some clarity, you know, you know, you're like, I know, I don't know what the actual truth is, hmm. but I know at least enough of the truth. I know that these events are real the phenomenon is real so uh yeah it deeply impacted my life and uh, the way i think about the universe and the way i think about religion and the way i think about spirituality and and history and everything um human origins i mean so yeah it was profound for me and my advice to People that experienced it, you know, be cautious. Um, you need to be cautious who you share good and bad bad news with, right? Um, because there, you know, there is a massive stigma even now. It, it's it's been reduced a bit, but it is still very powerful. And you have to consider that it could affect your career. It could pre prevent you from getting a job. Uh, family members might stop talking to you. Um, you know, it, it could affect your, your social, um, circle. So think about it, think about it hard and deep and think, you know, what is my, for me, I had to think deep, like, what is my, what's, why am I doing it? What's the goal? Mm -hmm. What's the motivation? What am I trying to do? And, um, because at any time I could have, I could have just put this information out there. I could have went on a radio show or tried to get it out or just posted it online and, and yep. on my own podcast. But that's, that was never what I, I wanted to do. The, the real thing for me was getting angry 
it, it's seeing other people that are credible and have experienced it and, and seeing them derided and humiliated. And, you know, and over the years since 2003, you know, stories would come out, credible witnesses, they would say this would happen. And, and, you know, then the debunkers and the skeptics and the bullies and the trolls come after them. And I would just sit there like, you don't, you people don't know they're right. You know, it's, maybe that story is not 100% true. I don't know. But the phenomenon is real. And this is happening to people all over the world. So there was a, there was part of me that wanted to bring this out, you know, to, to show. Like, these people are not crazy. And it's real. And they need your support. Because this can be traumatic to people, too. Especially, like, with the abduction stories. You know, what, what could be more terrifying than that? Um, so I would say if you're an experiencer, think about what your motivation is for coming out and, and consider how it'll impact your life and then make a decision on whether or not you, you want to come out because people have to understand it. When you, when you jump into this UFO world, you are jumping into the, you know, the same realm as the paranormal and ghosts and witches and goblins and Bigfoot. And, um, and people will hold that against you. So you have to have courage. It's good to have people to back you up, you know, if your family's supportive and your friends. And that was hugely important to me, you know, having people around me that, that had their hand on my shoulder saying, you know, we've, we've got your back. Yeah. If the whole world turns on you. You're good. We've got you. So, um, But I do encourage people to come out. We need everybody we can to come out and, and join this battle because it's the battle for reality. It's the battle for history being made. That's good advice. I've had people email me to say they listen or watch the podcast and they share a story with me and say, can you just keep this to yourself? I just thought I'd share it with you, but I don't want it to, to be read out or talk about it yet. I don't know. And yeah, so I think it helps when they hear folks like you come out and, and kind of share your experience too. Um, last couple of questions. Uh, one from Sean. He mentions uh, you mentioned motive and motivation. Sean asks, "What do you think is the motive behind these encounters?" I wonder, this, particularly those events at Vandenberg. Uh, do you ever think, or you must think, you know, why did that happen? What were they there for? Absolutely, and that that's the big unknown, right? Like, what are they doing? Like, why? Why? Why are they interacting with some people? You know, why are they interacting with some things and not others? Because the whole phenomenon is so random. You know, these things mm -hmm. appear to people in traffic. They show up on, at nuke sites. They show up at playgrounds. Um, so trying to figure out the motivation is a huge unknown. But I definitely believe that there is an aspect related to consciousness, um, and I, I believe that from personal experience because um, the, the encounter that I had, um, we were talking about it. You know, me and my friends were sitting around talking about this very subject. And then one came and said hello. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, for, for years I just thought about that. Why did it come? You know, it, was it random? Did it just show up? Is it a coincidence that we were discussing it and then one showed up? And over the years, I've come to the realization or the belief, the personal belief that there are no coincidences. Like everything is happening in some strange way for a reason. And um, I don't know really what to say beyond that. I don't know what the motivation is. But that's why we need to know. We need to know, like, why does it show up? It's certain military installations, like with Ryan Graves' unit. You know, what are they doing out there floating over, over the ocean all day? You know, what's the motivation? And you can, you can analyze it tactically and you can say, well, it looks like surveillance. It looks like enemy surveillance. They're surveilling capabilities, intent. Um, and that's scary, right? Like, Why? Why are they yeah. surveilling us? But we are definitely under surveillance. But that's that's the big question. Why? <laughs> and I don't. It's that 
it's the old um, muddy boot print analogy, isn't it? That, you know, you go to bed at night, you lock up your house, you wake up in the morning and there's muddy boot prints all over your sitting room. Nothing's moved. No one's been hurt. No one's been damaged. There's no evidence of who was there, but someone was there. Yeah. And it keeps happening. Why are they doing it? You don't know. And almost that not knowing is just as bad or worse than, than knowing. So, um, yeah. It's interesting but scary conversation. And final question from David. David's all the way out in Hobart, Tasmania, so pretty far away. So thanks for sending in this email, David. Probably took another few seconds to get here than anyone else's would have. Um, do you think, Jeff, the world's current population is capable of understanding and accepting what is happening and why? And do you think historians will be capable of absorbing these changes? That's a really good question, too. I think it depends. Um, I think there's a lot of, it depends on culture. It depends on social norms, where you are. It, it depends on an individual level, what you believe deeply and what you don't. But the only thing I know for sure, or I believe that there will be, there will be disruption for sure. Um, and there's a potential for backlash, panic, hysteria. Um, but I, my, my personal opinion is, at least in the U.S. and let's just say the West in general, that we've been, we've been not indoctrinated is not the right word, but we've been, um, you know, we've watched science fiction. And we watch all these movies and I think it'd be easier maybe for at least in America for people to, to, to swallow this pill. And I think the recent polling shows that most Americans believe UFOs are real, but it's very difficult to predict, you know, what, what actually could happen. Um, but in general, I think regardless of whether we're ready or can handle it or not, we need to know. And um, I think people, we need to know what the fundamental nature of reality is. Like, where are we in the universe? And it's much more mysterious than we thought. So my hope is that we are ready uh, as a world and as a species. And um, there might be some initial panic and there might be some disruption. But I think it's going to be the same thing that happened to me. It happens and then you go back to work. Hmm. You go pick up your kids at daycare, you clean, you, you go about life. Unless there was some kind of like ground shaking event where it's like, well, now they're here, you know, and it's like a movie where they're floating over the White House. And, you know, it's like that that might be a different scenario. But I think if there was full disclosure, I, I, I try to be optimistic and I think we can handle it. We're very adaptable as humans. You know, we can adapt to almost anything. So, and as far as his history and the historians, it's hard to say. Um, right now, I mean, academics, most academics won't even look into it. Hmm. So, um, you know, it's fringe. So, you know, maybe if full disclosure happened and it was undeniable, then maybe the historians could get it right. But, but um, only time will tell. Absolutely, it will. And Jeff, you've been very good with your time speaking to me. Uh, it's been nice to finally get you on. Right. Wonderful for you to, to kind of share that story and, and your thoughts and speculate with us as well. Uh, Jeff, do you want people even getting in touch with you? I'm always hastened to say that at the end, but you are present on social media, aren't you? Yep. Um, I'm pretty new to social media, but uh, yeah, if you want to get in contact with me, you can DM me on Twitter or X, whatever, whatever it is. Yeah, I still, I still say, but I think everyone does, don't they? Yeah. It's Twitter or slash X, yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's the easiest way. Um, I'll put the username uh, on the description. I don't know if you know it off, but it's not your name, I know that much, um, but I'll put the link in the description. Sure, yeah, it's uh, Ice Alchemist 1-1. One, one. There we go. Um, I'll get that in description. And Jeff, great speaking with you. And again, hope to hear more from you soon, especially coming out and sharing further stories, testimony, and bringing further witnesses forward as well. Yeah, it was an honor and a privilege, uh, brother. And I'm a huge fan of the work you're doing. And anytime you need me, I'm here. So thank you so much. 
I appreciate the opportunity. That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access the shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, U-A-P-A-M. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic-tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer, a little Baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Folk. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shoved out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little more. Meditative game of dateful on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs, and there he was. Like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. Myself, and I climbed out the window after the elf, and I woke up in my bed, and there was something on my head, and everything was weird, and everything was red. And I helped out my boys, they thought this was noise, they thought it was a dream, and they thought it was my toys, they thought it was my problems, and they think I should seek therapy, and I don't know what it is, because it doesn't really scare me.